The book of Deuteronomy was written as Moses was about to die. It was the last month of his life. And the last words of God's faithful servants are always meaningful and always powerful. A, gener a new generation was preparing to inherit Abraham's land. A new leader had already been appointed. And Deuteronomy was Moses' last opportunity to pass on his wisdom to that new generation that stood on the edge of the promised land. I want you to come to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses said to them some incredible words. He said in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Him, unto him shall ye hearken. You know, God had said about Moses, if there's a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with that prophet in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses, said Yahweh, because he is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles. He beholds the form of Yahweh. And he wanted to say to Aaron and to Miriam, why were you then not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You know, he was a man who had not only 120 years of life's experience to pass on, but a man who had 40 years of direct contact with the God of Israel. A man who had a personal relationship with the Yahweh angel that appeared on God's behalf to speak as God's personal representative. And he dealt almost exclusively with Moses. And we're told in Exodus that Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. You know, what a relationship that was. And how sad the words at the end of the book of Deuteronomy where it says, when Moses went up into the mount and died there, and the word says, and Yahweh, that is the Yahweh angel, buried him in Mount Nebo. You know, what a relationship that was between Moses and God's personal representative, the Yahweh angel. And when he died, he was showing no signs of dementia, still sharp of mind, healthy in body. But have you ever thought of what verse 15 is really saying? It goes on in verse 18 to say, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. The prophet to come would be like unto me, said Moses, and God said he would be like unto thee, Moses. And we know those words are quoted in Acts chapter 3 by Peter where he said, For Moses truly said, A prophet like unto me shall come. And he applied him to the Lord Jesus Christ as being that prophet. So Jesus was not just the seed of Abraham, not just the son of David, but he would come into the world as a supreme prophet to speak the words of God like unto Moses. Now think about that in reverse. Could there be a higher commendation for a human being than to become the measuring stick for the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ? God wanted them to understand that there was one coming who would be the greatest of all men ever to walk upon the face of the earth. How would you recognize him? He'd be like under Moses. And no other person's ever had the honor of being called the one who would represent what the Messiah would be like like unto me. And he could say that because God had given him that revelation. What a testimony to the character of Moses, that Christ would be measured by him. And both Moses and Christ were to become the ultimate voice of authority on the will of God. Moses had laid down the words of God that he received in that divine revelation. And when Jesus came, he would take over expounding God to the people. He could say, 
But I say unto you, and extend the law of God and the law of Christ. Have you not read in the scriptures? It is written. And they became the voice of authority to reveal to people the will of God. What a great thing that Moses should be the one that God would choose to say, you want to know what my son's going to be like? Look at Moses. He'll be like Moses. No wonder they appeared together in the Mount of Transfiguration. This book of Deuteronomy is the personal legacy to Israel of Moses, the man of God. Let's just think for a moment about the name of this book. The Hebrew name is El Lidabar, which means these be the words. That's the way the book starts, these be the words. But the words of Moses were inspired by God. You know, we're told in chapter 30, verse 8, keep the commandments which God has given unto me, said Moses. He did not claim that it was all his own work. He was passing on the words of God to the people. He was an inspired prophet. He gave inspired commentary on the books of Exodus, part of Numbers and Leviticus. A commentary written expressly for the new generation. But it wasn't just for them. Deuteronomy was written for all future generations to follow. Both of the nation of Israel and the current Israel of God. Just come back to Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15 that we read this morning. I want to show you something there that it's a case where we just have to carefully read the words. Chapter 29 verse 15, sorry, chapter 29 verse 15. As Moses outlines the new covenant made with this new generation. Verse 1, these are the words of the covenant. Beside the covenant that was made at Sinai. All of those people there except a few were dead. So the new generation has to have a covenant of their own. But look what it says in verse 15. The covenant is made with every one of you standing here this day. But also with people who are not here this day. There are going to be people who are not here this day who are going to receive that covenant. And that's us, brethren and sisters. We've got the covenant in our Lord Jesus Christ. The greater than Moses has come. The promises to Abraham have been secured in his death and resurrection. We've become the Israel of God, inheritors of the commonwealth of Israel, heirs according to the promises. And God's made a covenant with us through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God foresaw that in verse 15. Come back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. The Greek name given to the book of Deuteronomy is Deuteronomy. And we find that in Deuteronomy 17 and in verse 18. Amongst the laws for kings. The word Deuteronomy in the Greek means the second law. You find it there in verse 18 where it says, a copy of this law. That's the Greek word Deuteronomy. In the Septuagint you have Deuteronomy. The king shall write him a copy of Deuteronomy, it says. A personal copy of the law had to be written by every king that sat on the throne. The Hebrew word for that in verse 18 is Hatorah Hazoth. You'll recognize in that the word Torah, which is the way the Jews described the five books of Moses. Literally again, meaning a copy of this law. But I want you to understand it wasn't just a copy of what had been written before. It was an interpretation of what had been written before. The same law, but now wider ex expanded and brought to light in a different way. So it wasn't a new law. The same morals, the same principles, the same regulations as Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus. But now they're delivered in a different way that people might appreciate that, under, that applying God's law was for their good. To apply God's law out of a positive motivation and not out of the fear of consequences. To introduce into the law a level of emotion you don't find in the other books. So it was not an amendment, not a revision, but an enhancement of what had gone before. An elevated interpretation. It gave them the means to see beyond the ritual to pick up the spirit of the law. In Exodus we have laws and rules and regulations with serious consequences. But when you come to Deuteronomy, you have positive reasons given. For your good always. 
Consider the feelings of other people. Appreciate God's righteousness and not your own. And we have a focus on the spirit of the law. Acting by positive motivation and not rigid obedience to legislation. Inspiration rather than rules. And motivation by love and not by human effort. And here was a book written 40 years after the law was first given at Sinai. A law now given to inspire people, not just to regulate a sinful nation of rescued slaves. And that's why we have to focus on the book of Deuteronomy especially. Now in chapter 17 verse 18, it gives you the benefit of Deuteronomy. He shall write out a copy of this Deuteronomy the king had to do, and it shall be with him in verse 19. And that word with him is a word that is used elsewhere of marriage. It had to become part of him. It became a personal thing. It became a humbling thing. In verse 20, that his mind not be lifted up because he's now king. It had to prevent power going to the king's head. If he sat down and he read this book, he would understand that God is the true king. Just come back to chapter 31 of Deuteronomy. It had to be read publicly every seven years before the whole of the nation. 31 verse 10. And Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, at the end of every seven years in the solemnity of the year of release and the year of tabernacles, when you've all come together, you shall read this law. And in verse 9, this law is the word Deuteronomy. You shall read Deuteronomy to the people. And it became a national public reading at least every seven years. They had to read it that way. Something that could be easily remembered just from a public hearing. Something that could be pondered over the next seven years. No wonder Deuteronomy became one of the most frequently quoted books from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Only Isaiah and Psalms are quoted more than Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is quoted 44 occasions into the New Testament. One thing about Deuteronomy that stands out are the key words. Words are introduced that we don't hardly ever read in the previous books. A clear difference is made between Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers when you come to the way Deuteronomy is written because it's written to inspire. And you have the introduction of emotions and reasons and positive motivations. Only in Deuteronomy do you get to love God with your heart, soul and mind. In Leviticus, you're told to love your neighbour, but you're never told to love God. In Deuteronomy, you get it over and over again. Love Yahweh your God. The theme of given giving is found far more times in Deuteronomy than all the other books of Moses put together. Generosity is encouraged by this book. Take all the given givings out of all the other books. You've got more in Deuteronomy than all of the others combined. And the same with the word heart. You add up Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers, you've got 16 occurrences of the word heart. Deuteronomy has 48 occurrences of the word heart. Because it's getting down to the motivations of why we do things. The phrase of teach your children, your little ones, your seed, is a theme constantly that goes through Deuteronomy. Passing on the truth, bringing the truth into the home. In chapter 29 we read, you stand here this day, you and your little ones. You know, what an affectionate term that was to introduce. And Moses domesticated religion to be a thing primarily in the home. The word covenant occurs 27 times in Deuteronomy. God frequently reminding them they were now part of the Abrahamic covenant. And they had to make their own covenant as they now stood on the edge of the land. And many other key words like hearken and consider and do and remember, which will be the subject of our last exhortation. This day with which we'll end today. Just some other factors about Deuteronomy to emphasise its importance. It was very likely the book of the law that King Josiah found when he was cleansing the temple. The reading of that book moved him so much 
that he undertook great and dramatic actions against idolatry and immorality. He was incredibly moved and was rewarded with eternal life for it. And perhaps most powerfully of all, to demonstrate the importance of Deuteronomy, is our Lord Jesus Christ himself under temptation. After nearly six weeks of starvation, being tempted with all kinds of possibilities, how did he respond to temptation in the wilderness? Well, it's obvious he meditated upon Deuteronomy. Suffered the hunger that he might know that by the word of God does man live and not by bread alone. And he quoted three times in the book of Deuteronomy in his response to those temptations. And it gave the Son of God spiritual strength under great trial. And there can be no greater recommendation of a book than that the Lord Jesus Christ should have his mind there while he was being tempted. And so we should give this book every consideration because by every word of God doth man live. Now there are many unique elements about the book of Deuteronomy because it operates on a different plane to the other books of legislation. For example, come back to Deuteronomy chapter 2 and 3. You know, there's something here which is quite unique in Deuteronomy and that is selected history. And there's other sections of Deuteronomy that actually pick up history with a point. So there's a whole section in chapter 9 and 10 about the prayers of Moses and what he had to say to save them from destruction. But there's, there's unique selected history. It's going to take one of these and that's in Deuteronomy 2 and 3. Now think about the new generation. Most of them were born in the wilderness. They knew nothing about the world around them. It was all new as they came across the land of Canaan. They hadn't remembered the dramatic events of Egypt and Mount Sinai, most of them. And Moses has to remind them of history. And he gives them a history lesson, not just of their wanderings, but of the nations through whose land they are passing. Edom, Moab and Ammon. And Bashan. And Moses says, I want you to take from history of these nations we're now going through, I want you to take just one lesson away. And you pick it up in the frequency of the words. And the words to note are these ones. Just come to verse 11. Giants. In verse 12, they succeeded them. And what we have is the history of Edom, Moab and Ammon, of how they came to occupy the land in which they now dwell. Edom was related to the family of Abraham. Ammon and Moab were related to Lot. So God had decided that these nations should have a place at that time in history. So what happened? How did they get their land? Well, look at verse 11. It says there, or that the Moabites in verse 9, God has given them a possession. In verse 10, who did they have to, to drive out to take their possession? The Emims or the Anakims. They were giants as big as the Anakims who were the ones that had scared Israel at Hebron. They were accounted giants as the Anakims. Verse 12, the Horims dwelled in Seir before time. Who did the, the, the children of Esau displace? Who did they succeed and destroy? Well, they destroyed the Horims, who were also giants. When you go through this record, you've got the same thing being repeated. In verse 19, the children of Ammon. God says at the end of verse 19, I have given unto the children of Lot for possession. That was also a land of giants in those days, called Zamzummans. Tall as the Anakims, and Yahweh destroyed them, and they succeeded them. And you need to just colour in the word giants, and Yahweh gave them the land, and they succeeded them. And we go through this history of all these nations over and over again. And the same in verse 23. The same in chapter 3 and verse 1. We went up to Og, king of Bashan. We took his cities, they said. Was he a big guy? Just look at the size of his bed. Another giant had been destroyed. And you see, the point is that Moses is saying in this selected history, if God wants you to have the land, you will succeed them. You will take the land. It doesn't matter how big they are. You will take their land. 
You see, God can remove any giant of the flesh and give their land to others if he chooses to do so. Caleb believed that was possible. You know, Moses had known the bitter experience of the spies in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, melting the hearts of the people. Oh, those giants, we couldn't face those giants. And Caleb and Joshua were saying, but we can if God is with us. And they nearly got stoned. And now Moses is worried about this generation. Will they wilt under the face of the giants? He says the other nations got this land because God wanted them to have it. You can do the same. And Caleb demanded Hebron as an example. Give me Hebron. And he drove out those giants. Come to chapter 9. He comes back to this theme in chapter 9. You see, we have to ask, why does this selective history get recorded? He says in verse 2, of, chapter, of verse 1 of chapter 9, Hear, O Israel, you are to pass over Jordan to go into greater and mightier nations, against the people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom you know. And again, he comes back to this point. Why is there such a focus on giants? Not just because one generation had failed. Those giants become a metaphor of the great stumbling rock between us and the promised inheritance in the kingdom of God. King Sin is a ruthless giant. We will never defeat King Sin in our own strength. But with God going before us, we can overcome him. Always remembering, as we read in verse 4 of chapter 9, not for your righteousness. In verse 5, not for your righteousness. In verse 6, not for your righteousness. It's God's righteousness that will go before us. And only by the declaration of God's righteousness can we defeat sin. And that's why we come to remember our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. The book of Deuteronomy has wonderful sections of selected history that we can learn from in which spiritual lessons are contained as we face the giant of the proneness to sin that we're all born with. But let's look at some other contexts now that show this inspirational aspect of the book of Deuteronomy. We can only just select a very few of many that we could go to. I want you to come back to Deuteronomy chapter 10 again. We went there briefly last night. We want to just go back and look at one other aspect. It says in verse 12, And now, Israel, what does Yahweh require? Fear him, walk in his ways, and to love him. In Leviticus, love your neighbor, but never love God. Now you have to love God. Over and over through Deuteronomy, you have this phrase, love Yahweh thy God. And if you love God, you'll imitate him. You'll walk in his ways, you'll keep his commandments, you'll be like him. You know, what a different motivation to... Exodus and Leviticus, where if you do it or else. And we saw in verse 17 the tremendous contrast between the greatness of God who controls universes we can't even yet discover. The great and the mighty God, a terrible God that knows everything about all those universes. Infinite, no limitations. But zeroes down in verse 18 to the fatherless and the widows who cares for the little people. And following God means justice without favour. Verse 17, no respect to persons because God doesn't have it. Thinking of others, you know, widows are mentioned eight times in the law of Moses. Seven of those eight in Deuteronomy. And that includes both their material and their social needs. We need to be very conscious of those in our midst. Maybe some are widows for the sake of the truth and chosen to remain single. Some are widows because of mortality. And the great need in our modern world is their social needs, more perhaps than their material needs. And to make sure they feel included. And it was the same with the strangers. You know, God's also caring for the strangers in verse 19. Love the strangers. And especially those who do come into our midst. You know, Exodus says, remember the soul of the stranger. Understand how they feel coming into a community like ours. We're not an easy group to mingle into. We all have history. 
We all have generations to talk about. We have our own language sometimes. Remember the soul of the stranger and make sure that they feel comfortable and accept them. Look how Israel brought in Ruth and Rahab and Etai the Gittite and Ebed Melech, Cornelius and the Gentiles. It wasn't easy to adopt those people into the covenant. But God says they can come and you have to care for them. Love the stranger. Come to Deuteronomy 23. You know, here's a, a great example of God-likeness in action. So many laws that God gave were contrary to human nature. You know, we are by nature selfish. We're born that way. But in verse 24 and 25 of Deuteronomy 23, generosity is encouraged. Now think about this, those of you who've got nice fruit trees and gardens and care for them, think about it that you're standing here looking out your front window. It says in verse 23, when you come into thy neighbor's vineyard, you can eat the grapes at thy fill. But you can't pick them and take them away. You can't put them in a vessel and cart them off. But if you're walking along the road and you see a nice vineyard or a nice orchard, you think, oh, I feel a bit hungry. And you can go in and you can pick and eat the fruit. And you see, you couldn't stop somebody doing that. They had the right to do that. You couldn't set the dogs on them, chase them away. You had to say, well, I'm glad that they're enjoying my fruit because God gave it to me. You see, generosity was encouraged. They couldn't steal your crop, take the whole lot away, but they were tied and tied to come in and to eat your trees. The only way you could not be upset was really believing that God had given it to you and that you owed everything to God and you're happy to share his benefits with other people. You see, Jesus taught the law of the heart the same way, didn't he? Give, he said. Lend. Not seeking to receive again. That's an attitude that is so difficult for our selfish human nature and our concepts of ownership. In chapter 24 and verse 19, just over the page, look at God's consideration for the feelings of others. Our attitude to those less in need. He says in verse 19, when you cut down your harvest, you can't go and, and, and do the gleaning. If you've left a sheaf out there, too bad, leave it for the poor. You know, they had to leave the corners of their property when they were reaping. And all left for the poor and widows. God had an entrenched welfare system for those who were in need. Now this law about leaving the corners of the field, if you were a legalist, you would look at the law and you'd say, ah, there's no size of the corner I have to leave. I will leave three inches. Or you could be Boaz and say, let some handfuls fall of purpose for her. You'd make wide the corners that were left. You'd drop a few sheaves because there were poor people there and you would feel for them. And you see, Deuteronomy just opens up all these possibilities which a legal mind can't cope with. Where there are no regulations on how much generosity is. And God's saying, be like me. Am I generous? Am I gracious? Do I give you more than you deserve? Well, you think about other people when you're doing these things. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would you like to be treated? No wonder that became the epitome of the law of Christ. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Chapter 24 and verse 10. You know, here's a law of real consideration for the feelings of other people. Here's a man who's had to take a loan out. He's got to put up security, some collateral. All he's got left is his coat. He's got no furniture. He sold all his valuables. All he's got is a coat that he can put up for the, for the collateral on the loan. And God says in verse 10, When your brother, you shall not go into his house to fetch his pledge. You shall stand outside... And he shall bring it out unto thee. Now why is that little detail there? You're a rich man. You've got plenty. You're going home to a house full of furniture and good food on the table. If you were to go into his house to grab that coat, you would see how poor he was. It would take away his last shred of dignity and privacy. God says, no, you don't go into his house. You stand outside and he comes outside and he preserves his dignity by giving you the coat outside. But then look what it says. 
verse 12. Every night you have to bring it back. Because it'll be cold at night in Israel. It could be winter. And he will freeze without that coat. So you've got this coat for security. Every night you've got to think, oh, five o'clock, I'm trundle over to the poor man's house. Here's your coat back. Don't go inside. Here's your coat back. And he will sleep in warmth and he will bless you, it says. He will bless you in verse 13. And it shall be thy righteousness. You know, only twice in the law of Moses were they told that they could have righteousness by something they did. And it was always when you actually put yourself in the shoes of the other person. That's real righteousness. Not ticking off a list of rules. Your righteousness was thinking about the heart of the other person. You know, this is a remarkable example of how you had to do it. If you were the wealthy man, would you really bother to go there every night and take that coat back and turn up at 9 o'clock next morning and say, I'm waiting outside, where's the coat? Would you really do that? Or would you think about this is all he's got? All he's got left is a coat. If you really understood what God had done for you, you'd take a wagon load of, of provisions and goods to help him. You see, that's the spirit that's trying to be agendered by these laws. Look at chapter 22. As I said, we can only just touch on a sample of these laws that teach positive thinking about others, about personal relationships. But here's one that's got lessons embedded in it for us in our generation. This is the case of the animal that goes astray. Verse 1. You shall not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again to thy brother. And if your brother's not nigh to you and you don't know him even, doesn't matter. You shall, you shall bring it into your house. It shall be with thee. You've got to feed the animal, care for the animal until he comes looking for it and restore it to him again. And the same with the ass and so forth. But there's something that comes up. Again, get your coloured pencil out. Colour in these key words. In verse 1, you shall not hide thyself. In verse 3, at the end of it, you shall not hide thyself. In verse 4, you shall not hide thyself. Now, why does God keep hammering away at that point? Because to ignore this lost animal would be the natural human reaction. What do we do when we see someone in need? Oh, I don't want to get involved. It's not my problem. They should have kept better fences like I do. They wouldn't have this trouble if they looked after their fences. They're always a nuisance, these people, with their animals wandering around. Anyway, I don't really like him. Serves him right. Do I care? That's the natural human reaction when we see somebody else in distress and need. This man's lost a valuable animal. Or he's got sheep that have wandered away. And you see what it's saying there, only God would know what you did when you saw that animal wandering down the street. You could say, oh well, Bill Smith down the corner will look after it. He's always looking at it. God says, you saw the animal first. You take responsibility for it. Now why does God put this here? Why does he say three times, you shall not hide yourself? Well, sheep are frequently used of God's people going astray from the correct path. And we're all sheep. We all wander at times. Let me read to you three quotations. Psalm 119, verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Jeremiah 50, verse 6. My people have been lost sheep. The shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They've gone from the mountain to hill. They've forgotten their resting place. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 2.25 For you were his sheep going astray, but now you return to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And Jesus said, It is not the Father's will that one of the little sheep should be lost. And the scriptures abound with corporate responsibility for those who are lost and straying. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness is divine counsel. That's the law of Christ, says Galatians 6 verse 2. I want you to come to Proverbs 24. 
You know, we have this principle expounded further in Proverbs 24. And most ecclesias have a number of members and young people who are wandering aimlessly and in danger of leaving the path of truth, in danger of neglecting the hope of salvation. And not one of us can say, it's not my problem. Or, well, what else do you expect from that family? Or even worse, to say in your heart, it doesn't matter. There is a corporate responsibility for the lost. And God says in Proverbs 24 and verse 11, he says this, If you forbear, hide yourself. If you forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain. If you say, behold, we knew it not, you choose to say, it's not my problem. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? He that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And he will render to every man according to his works. You see, God was teaching us more than about the care of a few animals in Israel. And I do wonder, brethren and sisters, given the urgent times that we live in, whether the time has come for us to go into the highways and the byways and to really seek the lost, to bring back the sheep that have wandered before it's all too late. You know, James says, He that does convert a sinner from the error of his ways shall cover a multitude of sins. Perhaps both that of the straying person and our own. Because God holds that in high estimation. He will render to every man according to his works. And we can't hide ourselves away from God. And so the book of Deuteronomy became the basis of the new covenant. An inspirational book that gave people the insight into the motives and feelings of other people. And it was made with the new generation. Just come back to chapter 29 of Deuteronomy. The covenant God. I want to just conclude our exhortation this morning by just picking out some of the key words of Moses' final speech as he delivered the covenant to them. And they put their hand to it. It was the same covenant that God made with their fathers, the promises, the hope of Israel. And they likewise promised to obey it. And the covenant was made with them because they stood on the edge of the promised land. They could see the river Jordan and over the other side the land promised to their fathers. And they had to make a choice. The previous generation had been lost in the wilderness. And so when Moses laid down the new covenant for this generation, he emphasizes another key word. It's the word this day. If you haven't got this colored in through chapter 29 and chapter 30, it's there 12 times in those two chapters. This day, this day, this day. Verse 4, to hear unto this day. In verse 10 of chapter 29, you stand this day. The end of verse 12, this day. Verse 15, this day. Verse 28, this day. And so on, so on through this. Why is Moses so emphatic about the urgency of this? You see, we can't delay facing up to the responsibilities of the covenant that we make with God. You can't say, look, I just want to pursue my career. I want to just get this out of the way. I just need to do this. Moses says, look, this is the day. Why it is called today, says Hebrews 4. Because procrastination is fatal. Look at chapter 30 and verse 15. I've set you before you this day, life and good and death and evil. I command you this day to walk in the ways of God. But if you turn away in verse 17, I denounce you that you shall surely perish. You see, we tend to procrastinate on the important issues of life, don't we? Make the choice, he says in verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you might live and your children with you. 
And that's the choice we have to make, brethren and sisters. Because you and I also stand on the edge of the promised land. We have come to the feet of the greater than Moses. We have come to renew the covenant we made in our baptism. The covenant we made with the same unchanging God of Israel. And we come to remember the Son of God who stood on the Mount of Transfiguration alongside of Moses, a prophet like unto Moses. And of him it was said that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak, in my name, I will require it of him. And we can behold wondrous things in God's law. We see the law of Christ expanded even further with the focus on individual character. And we remember, as Israel did, how much God has done for us in bringing us all the way through the wilderness of life. Let's conclude with Deuteronomy 32 and verse 46. Verse 45, and Moses made an end. He was about to die. He made an end of speaking all these words to Israel. These be the words. This was the end of the story. He said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you. It is your life. You know, we're not just here because we're members of a club or because our family have always been in the truth. This is life, brethren and sisters. And through this you shall prolong your days in the land. We're looking for eternal life. To possess with Abraham the land of promise and to share in those glorious things that God has promised to those that love him. Let's renew our covenant, brethren and sisters, that has been made in the blood of the Lamb.